Whew. Praise the Lord. Uh, I thought I was uh, I thought I was here alone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to share a message with you this morning, and I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. We hope that you enjoy today's service. We pray that, pray that God will speak to your heart up there in Maine and Sajif. Uh, he told me, he says, he says, your church is my church. He says, I tune in every, every Sunday and every Wednesday night. And uh, we want to say God bless you, Sajiv, and your, your work there in India. We're looking forward to uh, many more good things happening there. And um, I, I just want to share from the book of Amos today. If you have your Bible, you say, Amos, where is that? Uh, Amos is in the Old Testament. He's one of the uh, uh, minor, they call him the minor prophets, not because he was any lesser degree than all the other prophets, but simply because the book was smaller than most of the main pro prophetic books that are in the Bible. <clears throat> the name Amos means a burden. It means a burden. And I want to encourage you because God doesn't call the most qualified people into ministry. I mean, you need to have some kind of training. You need to sit under a pastor for a while. You need to uh, be groomed. And, and uh, so many people have the mentality, I've got my Bible, I've got the Holy Ghost, that's all I need. And they've gone off and they have started all kinds of division in the church. They've, they've come up with all kinds of weird doctrine and teaching because they've not learned how to subject their own thinking or try to uh, examine their own thinking in accordance to the, to the Word of God. Now, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you in all truth, but He'll lead and guide you into the truth that you haven't deposited into your heart and into your spirit. As you read God's Word, as you place God's Word in your heart, that truth becomes more of a, of a stable um, rock that you can depend on in time of trouble. Amen? Most of the ministry that Amos carried on was carried on to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Amos uh, is believed to have prophesied between the years 760, uh, 765 and 755 B.C. during the reign of Jeroboam II. And although he had no formal training, his prophecy contains passages that were great literary beauty and oratorical skills. So many times I've heard preachers say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter, <clears throat> um, uh, or you need to uh, go to school, or you need to have a PhD to, uh, to minister, or, you know, you're not qualified because you don't have a master's degree. And can I tell you that that's not necessarily true. I know that's the standard of some men in their churches and pastors in their churches, but that's not necessarily so in God's church and the one that he builds. Um, it's good to have those things because it, it causes you to be more in-depth in the things of God and the teaching of God's word. But uh, I want to encourage you that if you don't have a formal education of Bible school training, God can still use you. Amen? And um, it's very interesting that Amos was a prophet that was sent to Israel during the greatest time of Israel's prosperity. Think about that. It was during the greatest time of prosperity, and it was because uh, God had a word in the midst of their prosperity. Now, let's compare that today. We see that the uh, stock market has gone up to 25,000. It's the first time it ever reached that particular plateau. And uh, we see things in the economy changing, and we see things, uh, prosperity is, 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 is rising, 401ks are rising. So many things are being on the upward scale. And uh, we, we, of course, we attribute that to the presidential change <clears throat> and the regulations being removed in many cases to many of the businesses. Many factories, many businesses are, are moving back to America. You heard of the many stories of the different um, uh, manufacturing companies and different companies that have given their, their uh, employees bonuses, uh, $1,000 in one case, $2,000 bonus. 
uh, to uh, tens of thousands of, of um, employees. And so uh, prosperity is on the increase and everybody's happy. The message that I want to preach to you today is it's time to face the hard reality. It is time to face hard reality. And so when you open up the uh, book of Amos, I want you to open up to chapter 5. And, and I don't know if you have this, uh, Brother Bob, do we have the Message Bible up there? I, I, I think we do. Can we have it in that translation when I tell you which one we want to share with you this morning? And, um, but before I do that, I want us to look at Amos chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. I want to show you what Amos was doing before God called him into the ministry. Amos chapter 7, verses 14 through 15. <clears throat> and it says, but Amos stood up to Amaziah, and he said, I never set up to be a preacher, never had plans to be a preacher. I raised cattle and I pruned trees. Now, put the, end, uh, put the uh, King James Version up for me. It's a little bit different. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. So he had, like you, I would say, like a shepherd's heart. He was tending flocks. He was tending livestock. And he gathered uh, sycamore fruit. He was a laborer. <clears throat> And I want you to understand this morning that you don't have to be a pastor's son or a pastor's daughter or a deacon's son or a deacon's daughter or an elder's son or an elder's daughter in the church in order for God to call you and use you in ministry. I was talking with Pastor Don Grovner up in Phoenix, I should say down in Phoenix, Yesterday, had a nice conversation with him as we're getting ready to go in February to the missions conference. And he asked me again, he said, I want you to speak in one of the morning sessions. And I said, I would. So I asked him, I said, what is the theme of your, of your conference? And he said, well, pastor, he said, this has been the dilemma, the, the, the dilemma we have. I've been seeking the Lord and I can't seem to get an answer to a theme. And I was sitting there and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost just hit me. I says, well, have you ever thought of for such a time as this? And he thought and he said, I like that. To have a missions conference for such a time as this. When the church is going haywire and doing all kinds of things. He says, I might just take that thought. I said, well, go ahead, brother. It's free. You can have it. So here he was just a... Farmer, if you will, a laborer, if you will. As he followed the flock, and the Lord said to him, verse 15, And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Hallelujah. God is willing to use anyone who is willing to go. God will use anyone who is willing to be obedient to speak that which is on God's heart and not so much that's on man's heart. God wants to use every single one of you to accomplish a goal in your life. Did you know that? Do you know that each one of you are valued before God? Each one of you has a tremendous value to God and the enemy is the one who steals that Joy steals that peace, steals that vision, steals that goal from you, and you seem frustrated all the time, and you can't make that goal, and it's because the enemy is fighting because he knows that God has a purpose in that goal for you and I. Amos was unpopular because he preached during a time of great prosperity. He was unpopular because he was, he was coming against them because one of the things that happens when people prosper is they have a tendency to forget God. Remember, God spoke to uh, um, 
Solomon. And, Solomon, and when Solomon was seeking the Lord, and, and, and God said to Solomon, Solomon, he says, I'm going to give you wealth. He says, and the reason why I'm giving it to you is because you didn't ask for it. You sought for my wisdom and how to rule and reign over my people. You didn't look for wealth, but I'm going to give it to you. And see, but even in that, Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived besides Jesus Christ, used hardly any wisdom when it came to marrying foreign, foreign women. Even took away his heart, even built shrines of, to the false gods. That's how these women took his heart away from God. And so you see that time and time again, that God always raises up a voice for someone to speak up, and that's you and I. That's not just the pastor behind the pulpit. That's not just the, the apostle or the evangelist or the prophet or, or, or the apostle. No, it's, it's you as a Christian to rise up and speak whatever God puts upon your heart for the people of God. He also condemned false religion. Practiced at the altar of Bethel. If you know anything about the Bible, if you know anything about Bethel, Bethel at one time was, was, was mocked as the house of God. But what happened here with Israel is they began to offer strange fire in the place of true worship. They began to build these foreign gods in the house of God in Bethel. So Bethel became a a, a, a curse rather than a blessing. Not only was he unpopular because he condemned false religion, but the false high priests also opposed him. How many know that there's a false religion, there's a false gospel, there's another Jesus that's being preached today? Paul said it, he warned, he said, if any man come preaching another Jesus or you receive another spirit, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Because there is another Jesus, and there is another spirit that's out there. And that's floating in many of the churches today, and, and they have their high priests, if you will, and they say it's okay for you to stay the way you are. You don't need to change, because God's grace covers everything. Well, they don't know about Romans 6. They don't know about... 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. They don't know about following the Lord and obeying His commandments. But I want to read a word to you, and, and, and you can put this on the message, uh, this scripture here, in chapter 5 of Amos. Titled, Time to Face the Hard Realities. Now, how many want the Lord to come? How many want the day of God's judgment to come to settle all things? Well, let's look for a moment in chapter 5, verse 18. It says, Woe unto all of you who want God's judgment day. <laughs> See, because God's judgment day is a day where things are not going to be continuing like they are now. The judgment day that God's word speaks of is, I believe, during the tribulation period for the children of Israel. The seven-year period of, of tribulation is for Israel. It's not for the church. There are many that would argue that point, but I, I say your argument is fruitless. It doesn't make any difference. Because your argument doesn't line up with the word of God. Israel is going to go through the tribulation. Who is Amos talking to? Israel. And he says, Woe unto all you who want God's judgment day. Why would you want to see God? Why would you want to see God want him to come? Question. When, here's the answer. When God comes, it will be bad news before it's good news. It will be worst of times, not the best of times. Now, how many of you still want him to come? I do. I do. I want him to come. 
Because when he comes and I know we're in the end. When I hear that trump of God sound and the dead in Christ rise and we which are alive and remain caught up together with him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord and we'll be at the bema seat of Christ. At the white, uh, we'll be at the uh, judgment, uh, the bema seat being judged for the good and bad that we've done. And the earth is going through the seven year tribulation period. And then finally that day will come when the cloud will roll back and he will come with his saints, not for his saints. And we will we'll be riding with him to retake and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And then after that period of time, God says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth where dwelleth righteousness. But he says, woe unto them who want God's judgment day. Why would you want to see God? Why want him to come? Well, when God comes, it will be the bad news before it's good news. The worst of times, not the best of times. So what he's telling them is, is you better get ready. Don't be fooled by the economy and what's happening in the world today. There was a, someone sent me on Messenger, a prophetic word that was given to the church, and part of it was good, but part of it wasn't so good. And I took it as this, that the Bible says we prophesy in part and we only know in part. So I'll take the part that is of God, but the other part that's not of God I won't take. And he was saying, thus saith the, says the Lord, that uh, everything's going to prosper and everything's going to go well. And, everything's gonna... and I say, no, that's not what my Bible says. It says... Things are going to wax worse and worse. There's going to be a great falling away. Jesus said, when he comes back to earth, will he find faith on the earth? That's pretty, that's pretty uh, doomed. Will he find faith on, on the earth? I guess Jesus didn't know that, did he? Yeah, he knew. It's going to be good. It's going to be bad times, good news before it's uh, good news, and the worst of times before the best of times. And he goes on in the next verse and says, here's what it is like. Yep. Here is, here's what it's going to be like. A man runs from a lion right into the jaws of a bear. You think you've just finally escaped one situation? You're faced face to face with another dangerous situation. Have you ever been face to face with a bear? Well, some of you might have been married to the wrong. Well, no, I won't say. That. I won't say that. Our woman goes home after a hard day's work, and is raped by a neighbor. What is that saying? And she's so worn out from trying to make ends meet that she doesn't even have the strength to fight off her neighbor. Next verse, please. At God's coming, we face hard reality, not fantasy. A black cloud with no silver lining. It's a little bit different than what you're used to. You know, we think, oh, God, when you come, it's going to be great. And it will. That's the good news, but we've got to get the bad news first. I always like to get the bad news first, then the good news. Because the bad news brings you down, but the good news brings you back up again. I'd rather, I've, I'm up, if I'm up, I don't want to hear the good news first and then the bad news, because then I'm up and then the bad news takes me down. So I'd rather have the, bad, the good news at the end so I can have something that will lift me up again. Amen? So it's always good to get the bad news first. Don't always say, oh, give me the good news first. No, you want the bad news first. And then the good news. He says, when he comes, we're going to be faced with a hard reality. Not a fantasy. Not sitting there thinking everything's going to be hunky-dory and everything's going to be fine. And, you know, and no. No. It's, it, the prosperity that we're experiencing now, I believe God is, is using that to show us 
hey, I'm looking at where your heart is. Where is your heart? Where is my heart? What if God was to tell us to sell everything we have, give it to the poor, and follow him like he did his disciples? Would we? Think about it. Would you do that? Well, it's easy for someone that doesn't have much. But it's a lot harder for someone who has a lot more. But Jesus requires that of us. He said there's going to be a black cloud with no silver lining. It doesn't matter who we have in the White House. So in this prophecy, this, this pastor or minister or whoever he was was sharing, he was saying that God is going to begin with judgment. And how he's going to judge the church, which is true because the Bible says judgment will begin in the house of God, is that the half-hearted, the lukewarm, he's going to spew out of his mouth. His hand that's been on people's lives, because they're not committed, he's going to remove and he's going to take away everything that they have. Why would God do that? Why would God allow that to happen? Because he cares more about your spirit than he does your solical life. He cares more about your your destination of where you're going to end up for eternity than this little planet Earth where we're only here for a short time. And so this, this pastor was preaching that, and he was saying, and he was speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said, these are things that are going to happen. He said, I'm going to remove my blessing from their homes. I'm going to remove my hand of blessing from their health. I'm going to remove my hand of blessing from their wealth. Why? And this was the answer. Because they have forgotten me. He said, but to those who have not, and those who have struggled, and those who have kept the faith, and those who have stayed on with me, I'm going to bless them and increase them. Before we get into verse 21 and 24, let me just say this. There are many false high priests that are going to disagree with this word today. But I believe more than anything else, what we need is to be committed to the Lord. Wholeheartedly, 100%. Not for the benefits, but simply because we love Him. I preached a message a few years ago called Following Jesus for the Loaves and Fishes. And if you see the, that scripture in uh, Matthew where Jesus, uh, the boy came and, and, you know, the crowds were there. He fed 5,000 and another time he fed 4,000, so he had a church at least of 9,000. And as long as he was supplying the, 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 the bread and the fishes, the people followed. But the moment it came to Gethsemane, the moment it came for him to be crucified, when he was in the garden, where was everybody? Where were the 9,000 that he fed, that he took care of, that he spoke words of life to? They were nowhere to be found. So in this particular situation that Amos was facing, in this particular religious setting that Ab Amos was facing, he said this to the then, if I can say, to the then meeting of people in a public place or the temple. Or maybe we could apply it to the church today. Next verse. He says, I can't. Now remember, understand, this is God speaking. This is not Amos speaking. This is Amos' voice, but God is using Amos' voice and he's speaking through him. See, many times people get mad at me because I say something, and it's not me that says it. I, I mean, 
If you want to live your life the way you want to live it, that's your business. But sometimes God puts something on my heart to tell you, and I'll tell you, and sometimes people have gotten really angry and mad at me. I had one guy one time want to punch me in the face. And it wasn't nothing bad. I mean, it was just something of correction. But here, God's speaking to the people, and he says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and your conventions. Whew. Wow. Every time you turn the television on today, there's a convention here, there's a conference here, there's a conference there. And all the conferences are, 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 are ways to get your money, to sell you some new CD, some new thought, some new program. That's why I like missions conferences. When you go to a missions conference, they don't want any money from you. They feed you three meals a day, and they feed you God's word. The, the missions conference that we go to, the pastor flies in over 30 missionaries from all over the world, and he pays for every single one of them. And the offerings that we take, he doesn't keep for his church. I think, what did we collect the last time? Was it almost 80000 or something like that? That 80000 was divided among the 30 missionaries to go back to their, their places and use that money for the kingdom of God. But the conventions and the meetings today is to make the pastor more profitable so he can buy a bigger boat, a newer Rolls Royce, a bigger mansion. Next verse. He says, I want nothing to do with your religion projects. Wow. Remember, that's God speaking. It's just in the ink today's English. I don't want anything to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. Here's a slogan. Come and give $100 and watch God heal your body. Come on right now. If you want a prophetic word, come on in the $100 prophetic line or the $50 prophetic dollar line. In the $100 line, you get a better prophecy than you do in the 50 And don't try to sneak a 50 into the $100 prophecy line, because if you do, your prophecy will be no good. Come on, somebody. That happens in the church, but the gullible people love to have it so. I can't stand your slogans and go, I'm sick of your, fa your fundraising schemes. You want to be blessed? Sow your seed of a thousand dollars. Why is it a thousand? You ever notice that? Why is it always a thousand dollar seed? Why not a $5,000 seed? Don't you want to be really blessed? Yeah, but you say, but pastor, a lot of people don't have $1,000. And they tell you, you can give it on your credit card. God says, I'm sick of your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations, and your image making. You make it look like it's God, and it isn't God. God don't need money. I don't care what people say. God don't need your money. You tell me how the apostles back then turned the world upside down and they gave up everything. They didn't have multimedia. They didn't have television. They didn't have radio. Didn't have a printing press. But you know what they had? They had a heart willing to obey the, the Great Commission. And individually, they'd go and share the gospel and say, hey, Peter's coming by tomorrow in the square. Come on, let's go hear Peter. They would drop what they would do and go and hear the word of God. Can I tell you, understand, please, Christians in the early church didn't have Bibles stuck under their arms. They didn't have access to the word of God every day. 
So whenever somebody came and was preaching the word, they would go with such anticipation, because, well, let's hear what God's got to say now. They would go and they would run and they would have a letter, you know, as Paul was writing the letters under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he says, bring this to this church and pass it to this church and pass it to that church. And they, they get the letter and then all the people would come and listen to it being preached. And that's how they learned. There was a hunger and a thirst for God. And they didn't have this compiled the way you and I have. But look at how many of us have four or five, three, four or five Bibles in our home, and they, they stand there with dust on them. We don't even read them. Uh oh. Now the second part, someone's going to get real mad at me. That's okay, I'm a big boy. First, before I get to the next scripture, I just want you to know something. You probably know already, but before I was a Christian, I played in nightclubs. I played keyboard in nightclubs. I played with different bands and went paid, played different venues all over the place. I was very successful at it. Played in nightclubs, people danced and all kind of went crazy, you know got drunk and did all those kind of weird things. So I know the difference when I came into the church and I heard godly music, godly worship, godly praise. I knew the Holy Spirit taught me the difference between what was of God and what was not of God. That's why I can hear music and I can tell you if it's God or if it's not God. But look what God says in this next verse. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. Are you hearing me? I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. Why did he say ego music? Why? And if you notice, a lot of the music today, it's not worshiping God, it's all about I. It's all about you. I am a friend of God. I Who cares? Good, you're no good. I'm glad you're a friend of God. But what's that got to do with worshiping Him? He said, I can't take your noisy ego music because it's all about you. It's all about what I get out of it. How many times you hear people leave the, a, a service and say, I didn't get anything out of worship? I, I didn't get nothing out of worship. Well, that's because you didn't put nothing into it. And some of the time you can't get nothing out of it because there's nothing to come out of it. It's worldly. Then you see the churches, they got the, the pink lights and the blue lights and, and, and the lights are flashing and, and then the, the spotlight on the, on the singer and the singer's got their jeans tight as anything else. And shirts are all tucked out and because they're trying to identify with the world to try to win them to Jesus. They ain't winning nothing to Jesus. They're winning them over to the flesh. Because let me tell you something, when the rubber hits the road and they're going to have to come face to face with dying on the cross and, and dying to, and to, de to die to death in order to be saved, be a Christian, they'll run away. Well, I, I have to give up my life? Oh, I don't want to give up my life. I want Jesus to bless my life. I want to live my life the way I want to live it, and, and God will just have to come alongside my life. No! That's not Christianity. That's another Jesus. And then God says to the children of Israel, this is sad. 
When was the last time you sang to me? When's the last time you sang to me? God's asking us that question. When was the last time you sang to me? Not about me, but to me. What an indictment. They had all the lyres and the hops playing in the house. They had all the finest musicians. Woohoo! Man, we got a worship team. Hallelujah. We got all the band. We're, we're, we're a hot man. We're a hot band for Jesus. Really? When's the last time you sang to me, the Lord says? When's the last time you were just closing yourself in with me, coming to the altar, worshiping me, not caring about who sees you or what this one's wearing or what that one's wearing or what this one's doing or what that one's doing or talking about the things of, of home or, or talking about what's cooking in the oven or any of those kinds of things. Or what's your next plan, and how a time is it, and how long is this going to be, and is it going to uh, how what time am I going to get out of here? God says, "When's the last time you sang to me? When's the last time you dropped your facade, your pretense? When's the last time you just lifted your hands and just closed your eyes and worshipped me, sang to me?" These are some real hard questions that Israel had to face. But God didn't answer these questions because he's a mean, cold-hearted God. He asked these questions because he wanted to get the people to see where they truly were so that he can bring them where they need to be. He wants to have a relationship. I, now, I know this for a fact. I know that if you meet someone on Facebook or, you know, if you're single and and you're looking for a, a boyfriend, you know, and, and one boy in school, you know, shows you that he likes you and you like him. Boy, man, you're passing notes back and forth. You're calling on the phone. You're spending texts back and forth. You want to go to the park with him. You want to go have ice cream with him. You want to be with him or, or, or her, or wherever you go. Because there's a relationship being built. It's the same way with God. Is relationship being built? And look what God says in this next verse. Do you know what I want? Let me ask you that question this morning. Do you know what I want? What does God want? What does he want from you? What does he desire of you? He says, I want justice. I want what's just for you. I want oceans of it. I don't want little drops here and there. I want fairness. Rivers of it. Be fair. That's what I want. That's all I want. Is justice. Do what's right. Do what's right in relationship with me. Do what is right. Sing to me. Put away your ego songs. Put away re your religious meetings that I have no part of. Put away your conferences and your conventions that leave me out. If you look in the book of Revelation, and you look at one of the churches, it says that Jesus is standing outside the door knocking to get in. 
Is that what Jesus is doing to you? Because a church is the people, not the building. Is Jesus outside of your life knocking to get in? Yeah, isn't it something when someone texts us, we're quick to respond? Somebody calls us, we're quick to answer. Hello, yes. But when God calls, and he's not going to get inside of you, inside of your heart, because you shut him out. Yeah, but pastor, you don't understand. He's in my heart. But what about this part of your life? Oh, well, well, now, pastor, don't go there. You know, what about, the, well, pastor, don't go there. Yeah, but you need to, uh, don't, don't go there. He, he's in my heart. God's not knocking at the areas of your heart that are already surrendered. He's knocking at those areas where you refuse for whatever reason to not let him in. And the sad part is, is that if you continue to refuse to let him in, like that prophecy was given, that now the lukewarm, he's removing his hand, and there's going to be a falling. God said in his word, there's going to be a great falling away first before the man of sin is revealed, which is the Antichrist. What is God saying this morning? It's time to face hard reality. Don't get fooled by the prosperity that's coming to America. Don't get fooled. It's going to be hard times before good times. It's going to be rough times before smooth times. And those that are here, I believe that are really seeking God, really press through, you know, those who have fought through depression and loneliness and gone through the, the fire and the floods, God's going to honor those pastors, those parishioners, those people in the church that have been crying out to him for more of him, have a desire for him. Come on. We, we have a desire for so many things. And we, we, we flood our life with so many things, but God says, what about me? Flood your life with me. I mean, think about it. He's the one that has all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness. He has all the wisdom, all the knowledge. He has all the blessings. He has everything. And yet we turn to everything else. Why? Why? We want everything else but God. Why? Because our hearts are hard. When God says when, I, when he comes into your heart and he comes into your life, he's going to replace that stony heart with a heart of flesh, a soft heart, so that you'll be able to receive the things that he's saying to you and I. It's time to face the hard reality. Many are going to fall away. There are some that, are in this, that have been in this church and they've fallen away. And I don't care what they say, it's what they do. Do you know how many Christians' lives, when they backslid, they lost their lives? Do you know how many Christians were in that fire in Rhode Island when that nightclub caught fire? They were backslidden Christians that were in the nightclub and that fire caught they, were, they perished in that fire. And just think they'd be alive today if they didn't backslide because they wouldn't be going into nightclubs. Hello? Amos was not popular. Preachers that speak the truth are not popular. And I'm not talking about being antagonistic or, or saying that you're all the only one serving God and all the other churches are all wrong. No, 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 no. I always go back to the 7,000 
Elijah's, you know, when he felt he was alone, he was the prophet, you know, and he sat there and he goes, woe is me. You know, I'm the only one serving you, God. And God said, excuse me, Elijah, let me tell you something. I got 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal yet. Okay? So any church that comes to you and says they're the only ones preaching the truth, they're the only ones, you can run from that church because they're, they're, almost, they're almost really saying that they're arrogant and proudful. Not confident, proud, arrogant. To think that the whole world, you are the only one. No, I don't think so. What does God want? Justice, fairness, rivers of it, oceans of it. He said, that's all I want. Be just, be fair with him. Last week's message was converted, but unbroken. And sad to say, there's a lot of people in the church today that are converted, but they're not broken. And God can't use you until you be broken. God can't use you to the fullness of what he wants to use you until you're broken. So let me ask you this question this morning in closing. It's amazing how people come to the altar and the following week they're nowhere to be found. The altar is not a place to come just to make things right for that moment. When you come to the altar, you're saying to God, God, I'm willing to leave everything else behind and I'm dropping it right here and I'm changing right now. I'm going to change right now. I'm going to change Because God loves you. God cares about you. You say, Pastor, when you going to preach on love? I am. Because whom the Lord loves, he corrects. He instructs. If you let your child run all over you, take authority over you, belittle you, belittle you in public, yell and scream at you, if you let your child do that, you don't love that child. If you let them go and have their own way and do their own thing and you don't care about where they go or who they're going with and you don't, you don't take a stand firm with your child, you don't love that child. Because whom you love, you correct. And if you correct them in the right manner and in the right fashion with love, they'll respect you for I remember my dad, he only had a sixth grade education. He didn't know how to raise a family. And if I didn't do something according to his way of doing it, I was stupid, I was no good. What's the matter with you? Can't you ever do anything right? I never held that against my dad. Because I knew where he came from. But I want to tell you this. God doesn't do that. God doesn't beat you. He lovingly, gently corrects you and bring you into the right, right pathway. Think about it for a moment. Nothing in this life, your wife, your husband, your kids, uncles, aunties, no one is more important than God. Because you know what? If God forsakes you, you're in big trouble. If man forsakes you, you can still go on. See, I didn't let the handicap of those statements that God said to me, I'm not that God said, that my father said to me, you're no good and you never amount to anything. What's the matter, you stupid? I didn't let those things stop me from moving on in my life. Did it hinder me? Yes, it did, until I became a Christian. Once I became a Christian and found out what true love was, I overcame that. And I was able to say to my dad, Dad, I love you. Two weeks before he died. And all the past is the past. Because one of the things he said to me two weeks before he died, he says, I wish I would have done things different. You know, they say you know when you're going to die. He said, Son, I wish I could have done things different with you and your brother. And I said, You only did what you knew how to do. 
I said, but that's over and it doesn't matter. I said, what matters is that God loves you and I love you and I'm here for you. And when he was in the hospital and he was dying, and it seemed like he was lingering a little bit, I looked him in the eye and I said, Dad, I don't know if you were there. But I said, I said Dad, it's okay for you to go. I'm going to be okay. I said, I got Linda. I said, and we're going to move on. It's okay, you can go. You don't have to worry about me. I'll be fine. Five minutes later, he died. See, sometimes we want to hang on to those things that we think mean the most, but we're really selfish. Sometimes we need to release. And so I want to encourage you today to release those things that have you bound. Release them. Release them over to your Heavenly Father. Give them over to Him because He loves you and He cares for you. Because the real reality of things is things are going to get worse. I'm not a gloom and doom preacher. I'm not. But I'm just telling you the reality of it, not the fantasy of it. People want to live in a fantasy life because it's more comfortable and more easy. But I'm telling you the truth. Things are going to get worse and worse. It's going to look like the, <laughs> what I'm preaching to you is false. <clears throat> it's going to look to you like everything's going to be just the reverse of what I've said this morning. But that's what happened with Amos. He went at a time when everything was prosperous and they would look like, who are you? Look at you. God's already blessed us. Look, we're blessed. I remember talking to, I'm going to close with this. I remember talking to a brother one time and we were talking about wars. And he said, oh, that, that, nobody can defeat America. I said, be careful. Be careful. Because it doesn't mean how many planes we have, how many nuclear weapons we have. If God's hand is removed from our nation of protection, Israel thought the same thing. Oh, we can go and defeat those people. We've done it before. We can do it again. They went in and they lost because their pride and their arrogance. Don't let pride and arrogance stop you from being blessed by God. Amen? Let's all stand in closing in prayer this morning. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you that you're coming back, Lord Jesus. You said, blessed are those who love your appearing. We love your appearing, but we know it's going to be bad news before good news. We know that things are going to be happening just before you come back. You said, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and rapidity. They're going to keep repeating and repeating and repeating. God, you said these things were going to happen. We believe it. But Father, I pray, Lord, every person within the sound of my voice, whether on Facebook or here in this assembly, God, that we will give our whole life to you. We will stop making excuses, flimsy excuses for not serving you. Excuses, and, 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 and what boggles my mind, God, is that people, they'll admit their excuses. They'll admit that what they're doing, but they don't change. Father, I pray that they will change. I pray that we will change. Because, Lord, we need more and more of you as this time goes on. We need more and more of you, Lord. In our hearts, in our life, in our homes, in our children, in our marriage, in our church. God, I pray your blessing, Father. Your blessing today upon your people. Bless their going in, they're coming down, they're, they're lying down, they're rising up. They're going out. They're going in. Father, I pray that you bless their uh, way home today, Father, with protection. No accidents. Father, I pray, God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. Greet one another before you leave.